Although it is nearly impossible to illustrate with charts the extremely complex structure of productive stages that make up a modern economy, we will use a simplified version of this structure with the purpose of clarifying the theoretical arguments we will later develop. We assume that the productive structure is composed of five stages, represented here by their value in monetary units, whose order number, in keeping with Menger's classic contribution, increases with the distance from the final stage of consumption. Thus, and considering that each stage requires a year, the first one comprises first-order economic goods, or consumer goods which, in this example, are exchanged for the value of 100 monetary units. The second stage is composed of second-order economic goods, and so on, until the stage furthest away from consumption. For instance, the process of producing a car consists of hundreds of productive stages, requiring a very prolonged period of time, from the moment the car company begins to design the vehicle, the stage furthest away from final consumption, orders the corresponding materials from its suppliers, manufacturers, until the product arrives at the stages closest to consumption, such as its distribution to dealers, and finally the delivery to its proud owner. So although when we visit the factory we see a finished vehicle emerge every minute, we must not deceive ourselves by thinking the production process of each car takes only one minute. Instead, we should be aware that each car calls for a process of production lasting several years, a process comprised of numerous stages from its design to final delivery. At all times, each of the stages coexists with the others, and therefore some people spend their time designing vehicles which will be available to the public in a number of years, while others simultaneously work on assembly lines and others devote their efforts to the commercial field. So what would the monetary income flow look like? Indeed, if we begin at the first stage, let's suppose that consumers spend 100 monetary units on consumer goods, and this money becomes the property of the capitalists who own the consumer goods industries. One year earlier, these capitalists had advanced from their savings 80 monetary units, corresponding to the services of fixed capital goods, and to circulating capital goods produced by other capitalists in the previous stage of the production process. The first capitalists also paid 10 monetary units to the owners of the original means of production, labor and natural resources, which they hired directly in the last stage, corresponding to the production of consumer goods. The difference between the total amount they advanced and the amount they receive at the end of the year is equal to 10 monetary units, or an interest rate of approximately 11% per year. We can follow the same reasoning with respect to the rest of the stages. Finally, we see how the total amount that the capitalists had been advancing at each stage to the original factors of production, plus the accounting benefits derived from each stage, in our example with a tendency towards an 11% rate in each stage, give us a total of 100 monetary units of net income, which coincides exactly with the amount spent on consumer goods during the entire period. How does an increase in voluntary savings affect the production structure? In our example, as a consequence of the rise in savings, we see that the monetary demand for final consumer goods decreases from 100 to 75 monetary units, reducing significantly the benefits of the companies closest to final consumption. Therefore, entrepreneurs will tend to transfer a portion of their demand for productive resources in the form of capital goods and primary factors of production from the final stage, consumption, and those closest to it, to the stages furthest from consumption, where the demand does not drop because the goods they are producing will be consumed within several years. There, they discover that they can still obtain comparatively much higher profits, since the market price of capital goods and durable consumer goods will tend to increase, making it investment in this type of goods more attractive, such as an industrial facility, a computer or a company's property. This way we can observe how a temporary lengthening of production processes tends to ensue, lasting until the interest rate, now appreciably lower as a result of the substantial increase in savings, spreads uniformly throughout the entire productive structure.
As the interest rates fall, the relative prices of capital goods produced by the companies situated furthest from the consumption stages rise rapidly, making the investment in these goods even more attractive than the investment in goods from the stages closer to consumption. The Ricardo effect also plays a role in this lengthening of production processes. As demand falls, consumer goods prices fall also, with the consequent rise of salaries in real terms. This would motivate entrepreneurs to substitute labor for capital goods, thus releasing productive factors from the stages closest to consumption that will be employed in the furthest stages. In conclusion regarding our first chart, the increase of 25 monetary units of voluntary net savings causes both a vertical lengthening of the productive structure via the addition of new stages and a broadening of the existing stages furthest from consumption and also a relative narrowing of the capital goods stages closest to consumption. In relation to the final stage of consumer goods and services, despite the initial decrease in monetary terms, it experiences a large output increase on completion of the lengthening of the productive structure, a large increase in production, which, having to sell to a more reduced monetary demand, results in a significant lowering of the market prices of the consumer goods, that ultimately represents a rise in salaries in real terms, and in general of all income generated by the production factors. This leads to the healthiest and most sustainable process of economic development which can be possibly conceived because it is clear that the longer production processes are, the more stages they contain, the more productive they tend to be. Just compare a modern tractor with a Roman plough. It is true that the first one is a capital good whose production requires a set of stages much more numerous, but the modern tractor ploughs the earth much more productively, which means that it is able to produce a much bigger quantity of food than the Roman plough at better prices. What effect does a bank credit expansion unsupported by a prior increase in voluntary savings have? Thanks to the fractional reserve, the bank is able to generate new monetary units from thin air in the form of deposits or fiduciary media, which are granted to the public in the form of loans or credit, even when the public has not first decided to increase saving. When a person deposits 10,000 euros in the bank, rather than safekeeping it all, the bank is only legally obligated to keep 2% and is able to lend the rest to another client. This client will use it to, say, buy a car. Thus, the seller of the car will deposit this money in another bank, which in turn will only keep 2% and will lend the remaining 98% in a process that can be repeated as many as 50 times. In this case, with an initial base of 10,000 euros cash, a supply of 500 thousand euros could be created. The creation of money by the banking system in the form of loans which are not backed by a corresponding prior rise in society's voluntary saving has some real effects on the economy's productive structure. From our initial chart, we can see that final consumption remains unchanged at 100 monetary units. However, new money is created and enters the system through credit expansion and the relative reduction in the interest rate necessary to persuade economic agents to take out the newly created loans. Therefore, the rate of profit in the different productive stages now drops from the 11% shown in our first example to slightly over 4%. Moreover, the new loans allow the entrepreneurs of each productive stage to pay more for the corresponding original factors of production, as well as for the capital goods from earlier stages which they obtain for their own productive processes. In our example, this effect expresses itself in the lengthening of the productive structure via the appearance of two new stages which are the furthest away from final consumption. In addition, the pre-existing productive stages are widened. Let us not be deceived, the new structure of productive stages rests here on a generalized intertemporal discoordination, which is the result of the mass entrepreneurial error provoked by the introduction of a large volume of new loans without the backing of real prior saving. The market's reaction will be relentlessly reflected in six microeconomic factors which will reverse the process. En primer lugar, el primer efecto que se produce es el de un eh, crecimiento importante en el precio de los factores de producción que demandan los empresarios, precisamente con las nuevas unidades 
monetarias que han percibido del, de los bancos en ese proceso de expansión crediticia. Como no ha habido un crecimiento del ahorro, no se han liberado recursos de las etapas más próximas al consumo y la única manera de atraértelos a estos proyectos de inversión, por ejemplo, para construir el millón de viviendas, es pagarles una prima adicional. Entonces, el primer efecto que se observa es el de un crecimiento en el precio de la mano de obra, es decir, de los salarios, de las materias primas, de los factores de producción en general, de los bienes de capital, de los recursos naturales, que, que demandan para sí los empresarios. Entonces, este primer efecto ya es un primer toque de atención, porque cuando hicieron sus, sus proyectos, sus presupuestos, pues eh, eh, consideraron unos precios para el factor de producción determinados que ahora se ve que son más altos. Entonces ya es un primer indicio de que a lo mejor no van a obtener los beneficios que pensaban, o por lo menos en un importe eh, tan, tan, tan elevado como pensaban. ¿eh? El segundo efecto que se produce temporalmente después ¿eh? es el crecimiento en el precio de los bienes y servicios de consumo, porque... El dinero eh, se va extendiendo paulatinamente y por etapas entre toda la sociedad y en un primer momento llega, como he dicho, al bolsillo de los empresarios, pero ellos demandan factores de producción y esos factores de producción ven que tienen unas rentas más altas y en última instancia, tarde o temprano, llegan al bolsillo de los que son los consumidores y si su tasa de preferencia temporal no ha variado, siguen consumiendo en la misma proporción que antes, como ahora tienen más unidades monetarias, pues se dedican a esas unidades monetarias adquirir bienes y servicios de consumo inmediato cuando todavía no, no se ha producido el efecto de, de incremento de la producción de bienes y servicios de consumo como resultado de las nuevas inversiones porque todavía no han madurado madurarán en un futuro muy lejano entonces el segundo efecto es la subida en el precio de los bienes de consumo incluso a un ritmo, en una proporción que es superior al crecimiento de la de los factores de producción, por este efecto que hemos dicho. En tercer, el tercer efecto es el efecto de disparidad en los beneficios de las empresas que operan a lo largo de la estructura productiva de la sociedad. Porque claro, al crecer los precios de los bienes de consumo a un ritmo más rápido, eh, los beneficios de las empresas que trabajan en los sectores más próximos al consumo, pues yo que sé, las distribución, las, las grandes superficies, comercio al por menor, etc., pues eh, en términos contables eh, y relativos son mejores que los beneficios de las empresas de bienes de capital, que todavía no, ha, no han podido vender o culminar sus proyectos de inversión y además ven cómo sus eh, inputs, sus factores productivos cada vez eh, les cuestan les cuestan más, ¿no? Entonces, esto, esto es otra, otra señal que indica a los empresarios. Oye, a lo mejor os habéis equivocado, porque donde está el beneficio es en las etapas próximas al consumo, no en los proyectos de inversión eh, tan ambiciosos que habéis eh, emprendido. ¿eh? Luego está, hay un, en, un cuarto efecto, que es el efecto sobre los tipos de, los, los tipos de interés, y es que cuando se crea el dinero de la nada y se inyecta en el sistema económico prestándolo a los empresarios, se reducen las condiciones que se piden a cambio de los préstamos y el tipo de interés, precisamente para que los empresarios se animen a pedir préstamos. ¿no? Pero cuando ese dinero ya se ha prestado y los precios de los bienes de consumo empiezan a crecer, y empieza a haber lo que se dice a nivel popular, inflación, etcétera, los tipos de interés vuelven a su nivel anterior e incluso, a, a, en términos nominales, a un nivel más alto, porque incorporan ya una prima que prevé la pérdida de poder adquisitivo de la unidad monetaria. Claro, y esta subida de los tipos de interés eh, hace que el valor hoy o actual de los bienes de capital, de las instalaciones fabriles, de las viviendas, eh, de los pisos, etcétera, se reduzca. Si el tipo de interés crece, el valor hoy de los bienes de capital se reduce. Y entonces, esto es otra señal en el mercado que indica de, oye, resulta que aquello en lo que estáis movilizando los nuevos recursos monetarios creados en la expansión crediticia, que es en bienes de capital, resulta que su precio de mercado está cayendo. Es otra señal clarísima de que se está cometiendo un grave error. Pero luego hay otro efecto, que el quinto efecto esencial, que es el que Hayek bautizó efecto Ricardo que nosotros deberíamos de llamar más bien efecto Hayek, que es el efecto que tiene eh, este proceso sobre los tipos reales de los salarios. 
si los precios de los bienes y servicios de consumo empiezan a crecer a un ritmo rápido, como he indicado antes, por el impacto de que el dinero de nueva creación termina llegando al bolsillo de los consumidores que demandan bienes y servicios de consumo, si los precios de bienes y servicios de consumo crecen a un ritmo rápido, más rápido que los salarios, significa que en términos reales los salarios tienden a bajar. Y si los salarios tienden a bajar, es una señal esencial que indica a los empresarios que deben, en el margen, de utilizar más mano de obra y menos equipo capital. Es decir, más trabajadores, a lo mejor con más turnos, y no comprar ordenadores, maquinaria... Es decir, precisamente los bienes de capital, eh, resultado de los proyectos de inversión que han iniciado los empresarios en la etapa de la, de la burbuja. Sería, por tanto, el efecto Ricardo, el quinto efecto. Y el sexto ya es cuando se pone de manifiesto todo esto junto a la vez. Es decir, que los empresarios, engañados por el crédito fácil que han recibido de la banca, que opera con reserva fraccionaria, han emprendido proyectos de inversión demasiado ambiciosos, que no son sostenibles y que solo son rentables en las circunstancias de la burbuja en que los tipos de interés eran tan bajos. Ahora se pone de manifiesto que esos proyectos de inversión no producen bienes de capital que no tienen demanda. Por ejemplo, el millón de viviendas que se hicieron por error en España y que no encuentran comprador. Que los beneficios están no ahí, sino en las etapas más próximas al consumo. Que eh, el tipo de interés tan alto hace que no sean sostenibles ni rentables esos proyectos de inversión. Cuando se descubre todo esto a la vez, se pone de manifiesto los errores de inversión cometidos. Once the crisis has exploded and having carried out the necessary readjustments, we would have a new flatter productive structure which would consist of only five stages, having disappeared two of the stages furthest from consumption, which were developed as an error generated by the credit expansion. This structure being less capital intensive results in lower production of consumer goods and services that nevertheless receive a higher monetary demand, generating a sharp increase in the price of consumer goods and services and a general impoverishment of society, which, although nominally has seen an increase in money income due to the much faster growth of consumer goods prices, ends up losing in real terms. Moreover, the interest rate or rate of accounting profit to which each stage tends to has risen to a level which even exceeds that of the interest in the credit market prior to the credit expansion. Ultimately, we have demonstrated that there is no theoretical possibility that banks' credit expansion, if not backed by a corresponding prior rise in voluntary saving, will allow society to reduce the necessary sacrifices all processes of economic growth require and foster and accelerate sustainable growth in the absence of a voluntary decision made by citizens to sacrifice and save. On the contrary, credit expansion causes a bubble that initially creates the illusion of greater economic development, but inevitably leads to an economic crisis that with tragic consequences reverts to the previous stage. In the light of all we said, we see that the crisis is the stage in which the errors induced by easy credit not backed by real saving are identified and liquidated.